Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, I'm joined by Sami Inkinen. Now, you probably heard of Sami Inkinen. You've probably heard of Verta Health. But with Sami, he's a data-driven tech entrepreneur. And I think those words fit him so well. And you'll see during this interview why data-driven tech and entrepreneur all sort of wrap up. And as you'll hear, he actually started off in Finland with a physics degree and worked in nuclear power, power plant as a physicist, found his way to Stanford Graduate School of Business where he got his MBA, um, co-founded Trulia.com and was the COO at that company, sort of revolutionizing how uh, home real estate is, is handled. Um, and then because of some personal health um, discoveries of bordering on prediabetes, despite being an elite athlete, uh, stumbled upon found, co-founding Verta Health uh, with doctors Jeff Folek and Stephen Finney. You'll hear about that story. But what I see is is most impressive is how they really this company is is um, disrupting or revolutionizing three different aspects of medical care. And one is reversing and deprescribing type two diabetes, which you know again as a medical student, as a resident, as a as a cardiologist, we didn't talk about those types of things until maybe the past ten years. Certainly the past maybe five years, it's become more prevalent. And now a lot of that is, is thanks to the work um, from Verta Health, but also the delivery of healthcare through a, a telehealth model and the reimbursement and the payment structure. And, and what Sami and his team, and he's quick to point out is not just him, but it's the whole team at Verta Health has been able to do is disrupt all three of these models um, for healthcare which has really changed the way we see not only type 2 diabetes, but treatment of almost any chronic disease. And they're, they're just continuing plowing ahead and growing and contributing more research to the field. And that's one thing that I think is so important, um, the impact they have had on the science of the use of a ketogenic diet and their continuous care model and how that can change the lives of people with type 2 diabetes, that type 2 diabetes no longer is a chronic condition that you just have to live with and, and try and delay complications, but it's something that you can reverse and get back to living a quote unquote normal life uh, from a health standpoint and no longer be saddled with type two diabetes and the complications that come along with it. So uh, just so powerful just to even talk about that in the introduction. So uh, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview with Verta Health CEO and co-founder, Sami Inkinen. Sami Inkinen, thank you so much for joining me today on the Diet Doctor podcast. Yeah, hi, Brad. Excited to be here. Yeah, so I, I, I've got to start with, you know, how, one, how I guess kind of in awe I am of all the things you've been able to do with Verta Health, kind of revolutionizing the way we treat type 2 diabetes. And the words diabetes reversal and deprescribing were really words I've heard, I've heard more in the past few years, and I've heard in 20 years of medical practice. And I guess one way you could think about it is it took a physicist from Finland to sort of change the landscape. So tell us a little bit how you were able to connect those dots, because on the surface, it seems a little unusual. Yeah, well, it does sound like, how did that happen? So maybe I'll just take a couple of steps back. Uh, you did mention that I, I grew up in Finland and was a physicist by training and, in, in fact, did spend a little little bit of my professional career in, in a nuclear power plant. But I would say the tool that I've always had in my back pocket has been software and technology. So I started you know, programming computers at a pretty early age and ran one of the first, not the first, but one of the first BBSs, so bulletin board systems in Finland. So I'm not that old that it would be would have been the very first, but <laughs> in the early days. So so that's been kind of the hammer in my back pocket, uh, software and technology and trying to solve meaningful problems. And then I came to America 2003, so about 19 years here now in, in the US. And soon after that started a company called Trulia, which uh was and is an online real estate marketplace and you know i had no residential real estate background of any kind before coming up with that idea with my co-founder pete and effectively we used software again that was the hammer in my my back pocket use software mm. to transform residential real estate of finding your dream home for the benefit of home buyers and and sellers so that's the tool that i've used now Obviously, the question is, how did you end up with Verta Health and reversing type 2 diabetes? That sounds like even a bigger leap than 
from residential real estate. But I just wanted to kind of illustrate that my expertise is not uh, medical or clinical. That's not my background. But I, I know a few things about software and how to how to use the capabilities of software and technology to, to do meaningful things. So what took me to the healthcare industry was kind of a personal stumble. So very, very briefly, I always thought, you know, type 2 diabetes and obesity, it's kind of a disease of lack of willpower, meaning, you know, it's not rocket science. If you eat too much, you gain weight. And if you eat the wrong things and too much, maybe you get type 2 diabetes. But I'm not going to have that. I'm an athlete. I'm an endurance athlete, do triathlons and super healthy and super lean. That was my thinking. And the, I think the only thing that opened my eyes and could have opened my eyes was that I actually became pre-diabetic and on my way to type 2 diabetes myself, which kind of pissed me off and frustrated. And I, it was puzzling. And for me as a physicist... Right. It just didn't make any sense, you know, as an athlete, lean person. I'm not one of them or one of those people. So without going into details at this very point, that kind of opened my eyes and said, hey, wait a second, maybe there's something in healthcare, type 2 diabetes and metabolic health that we don't know or we are looking at in a kind of an upside down way. And maybe there's a way to use science and technology and, and software to, to solve that problem. So that's kind of what happened. And then... We can go into the details of Verda, but in 2014, I teamed up with two amazing scientists to build Verda Health. And I, I've heard you say before on other recordings that you've done that when you, when, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, Dr. Steve Finney and, and Jeff Folek, that when you met them, you were actually a little skeptical at first. You're like, well, what is this crazy diet you're talking about? And does it, is it really going to work? And you were a little skeptical. So tell us about that sort of initial process that you went through to say, well, is this really going to work or is this something we should run with as a company and I guess the, the second part of that question is, did you know at that moment that you were on the cusp of sort of revolutionizing the treatment for type 2 diabetes in a way? Yes. So first to clarify, as, as you mentioned, yes, indeed, it, it is. And it was Dr. Stephen Finney and Dr. Jeff Bollock who became my co-founders for, for Verta Health. Um, but specifically to your, your question, I, I think there's a couple of things. So one... Um, I think it was 2011, 2012, so a couple of years before starting Verda, when I was surprised that a lean endurance athlete with eight-hour, 24-minute Ironman, which is reasonably fast for an amateur... Not reasonably fast. Not reasonably that, fast. Yeah. That is amazingly <laughs> fast. Just don't be so humble. Yeah, it could, could be on his way to developing type 2 diabetes. So I, I started reading a lot and, you know, talking to as many people as I could. So I, I think step one for me was just reading a lot of the science, uh, a lot of which came from Dr. Finney's or Dr. Jeff Wolleck's lab or, or Penn, and reading their papers and reading their science. So that it was kind of a long process for me, two plus years to read and try to understand, like, how can you be, you know, whatever, 70% body fat and pre-diabetic and... Of course, big part of it is it's it's less how much you eat, but what you eat was kind of I I slowly became convinced. But honestly, the thing that convinced me most was just trying it on myself and seeing that hey, yeah. you may maintain the same body weight, but if you change what you eat, you fundamentally change your metabolic health, which you can prove with lab results. So that's kind of the step one in convincing myself. Which is funny, even for me as a physicist. The papers were convincing, but once you experiment on yourself, you become even even more convinced. And then there was the step two, which was to actually meet uh, particularly Dr. Finney in, in person um, and kind of have a conversation with him. And this related to uh, initially to our, our, my and my wife's crazy adventure to potentially row a rowboat from California to Hawaii. So that's how I, I, I got to know Dr. Finney. And then I learned more and more from him that you potentially could not only improve the life of someone with prediabetes, with nutrition, but you could take a very late stage person living with type 2 diabetes, late stage type 2 diabetes, and reverse that whole thing. That's when I started thinking, wait a second, if you can take someone on insulin with type 2 diabetes and pull them back, get them off of insulin, that's kind of like a Nobel Prize winning worthy accomplishment. And if you can do that at scale, you actually 
should be winning a Nobel Prize. And so <laughs> at that point, I said, hey, wait a second. If, if there's something real here, we have to go and make this happen. Yeah, so you, you clearly had the, the reasoning, the personal reasoning, and you knew the scope of the problem, and you were getting into the science. So then it comes down to designing the company. What's the company going to look like? What's the intervention going to look like? And what are we going to use to support the intervention. And, and what I'm getting at here is you really did sort of this combination of a novel treatment, which you could argue wasn't novel, but a ketogenic diet on sort of like a mass scale is kind of a novel treatment because it's outside of the clinical guidelines, certainly when you started, using technology and coaches as the human touch and committing to research to sort of further back up what you were doing. So I, I guess I don't have a question here other than to say, I'm curious the the discussions and the mindset that went through of like, should we commit all this time and energy and money to doing clinical trials? Because that's usually not what kind of private industry does necessarily. It's yeah. usually, you know, drug companies and they're the ones who do the clinical trials. But you committed to that in addition to having to build out all the infrastructure for this program you were designing. So as the CEO, I'm just curious, was there a point when you were like, ah, maybe we shouldn't go that route because it's a distraction? Or were you just like all in, let's do the research, let's really contribute to the science as well? That's a good question. I think there were sort of a couple of questions to to address all at one. And let, let, let me start from kind of the designing the program and platform and, and, and the company. And I, I think the important thing to realize is that um, when using nutrition through behavior change as a therapy, it's one thing to say that, hey, here's the optimal, you know, grams and micrograms and micro, uh, sorry, uh, macronutrients and micronutrients. So you could define the very perfect protocol. So that's one thing. But it's a whole another thing to make people follow it at right. scale. Like you might say, hey, well, here's a protocol that an Olympic gold medal athlete is going to use, and it works perfectly well. Yeah, tweet that and say, here's a protocol for the whole humankind to be better or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And maybe one out of a million people can follow. So anyway, so, so that's a very, very important thing to realize that it's one thing to say, here's the perfection with nutrition and behavior change. And another thing to say, okay, what percentage of people are going to follow that? And that's a very, very important point because, you know, like 90% of Verta Health and our software engineers and data scientists and all the, the platforms that we built is there to try to make sure that we can deliver perfection to millions of people at scale. And so it was very, very clear to me that to do that, we can't, you know, employ and deliver millions of doctors and millions of coaches and millions of support people. It's not economically feasible. It's not practically feasible. And nobody wants somebody to be sort of 24 seven, be whispering into their ear. So the mantra that I had in my mind was like, if I can put Dr. Finney, my co-founder, into you know, the pockets of millions of people with the help of technology, yeah. then this could work. So, so that was a very important starting point that again, I believed in the science, I believed in the approach, but how do you make people follow at scale and make it economically feasible. So that's kind of the premise of, of Verda. How do we put Dr. Finney, his expertise, his science into the pockets of millions of people? So that's kind of the first part. And then to your question about the clinical trial, yeah, it was kind of a crazy that we are an unprofitable company with you know a couple of million of seed funding and say, hey, let's start a five-year prospective clinical trial. So in some ways it was a bit, but honestly, I personally felt that it was the only way forward for, for a number of reasons. And I, I'll, I'll mention sort of two or three. One, I knew that our business model would be to selling to insurance companies and large employers and maybe even U.S. government. So if you don't have real evidence, it's impossible to convince these conservative organizations to say, hey, yes, let, we should do that. So that was kind of one. And then the second thing was I found that with nutrition, anyone who eats something considers that they're an expert in nutrition. So there's 8 billion experts in, in, in the world. And so if you just claim and wave your hands, it's very difficult to break through the noise in the field of nutrition. But if you do something like solid science, you collect data, it's prospective, you publish peer-reviewed papers. Now, it's not going to solve everything. 
but it's certainly going to be much more powerful than being yet another person on Twitter telling what you think might be right. So yeah, we jumped into a clinical trial in 2000, uh, I guess this was 15, and now we are five years into it and we've published more than a dozen peer review papers. And I think it's been a very critical part of, of our foundation. Yeah, absolutely. Not just the foundation of Verda, but the foundation of type 2 diabetes treatment in general, um, because it, it's it been so powerful to have that data. But it, you know, it's interesting to, to think about it from a business standpoint, and, and you laid out the reasons absolutely well when you're talking to insurance companies and the US government, you need the data, but there's a risk there, right? Because any, any dietary intervention trial has been historically pretty poor in terms of retention. And if your studies would have come out showing 20% retention, you know, which is what so many of the other dietary trials show, you would have been in big trouble. But so fortunately it didn't. It showed but 74% retention at two years, which was pretty, pretty impressive. So um, tell us a little bit about the thought process and what you think the se- part of the secret is to that higher retention in this model. Yeah, well, well first let me just say, you know, if 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 something doesn't work, then I I don't want to waste my time. I'm, I'm, I want to go home and do, do other things. So you kind of have to go with that open mind, especially when you run a trial and say, let's see if this works. Like, let's test yeah. the uh, efficacy and safety. And if it doesn't work, whether it's retention or something else, like, I don't want to waste my lifetime on this. So, so it, it kind of, I, I, to me, that was actually a very, very important point. And the same with the scale of impact that I haven't yet mentioned our mission reverse type 2 diabetes in 100 million people. And sometimes people ask like, wait a second, like 100 million, why 100 million? I'm like, well, if I'm going to put decades of my life into this, why would we aim to help five people or 5,000 or 50,000? But in any case, so I I think you have to go with that open mind into a trial. But so your question was, why is the Verda treatment working and how can we keep people on, on a treatment it is true that we've had very high retention. So you mentioned 74% at two years. And you know, somebody might say, well, that's not 100%, that's correct. But the reality is that you are more likely, the Verda patient, to stick to Verda than take a pill. This is no joke. Like at one year, the retention to taking a drug at here is about 50%, 50 percent We had 74% at two years. And while it's not exactly apples to oranges comparison, I think I can confidently say that you're more likely to stick to Verda, this behavior protocol nutrition treatment than, than just to take a pill. And I think the drivers are twofold. One is, again, what I mentioned earlier, which is that we can deliver this sort of 24-7 feeling that Dr. Finio, our care team, is in your pocket through technology, through smartphone, in a cost-effective way. I think that is a one huge part of it. Um, that, that drives it. And then the second thing is, and you probably know this yourself very well, if something works, people are pretty likely to stick to it. If something's yeah. horrible, the experience is horrible, you're suffering and you're not seeing your results, you're probably not going to do it. And so when you combine those two things, that you have something that works and then a, a, a kind of very intensive support, nearly a 24-7, and you always know that if anything's wrong, I have a question, somebody's always there, whether it's the software or the human. I think that's a combination that drives that high retention, which is necessary. Yeah, I think that's a good point. The, the intersection of one, it's got to work, or it doesn't matter how much support or how fun it is. You're like, they're not going to do it if it's yeah. not helping their health. But the, the converse is also true. I mean, if something's working, but it's difficult to do and challenging and there's no support, and then that's going to be hard to stick with too. So I think that's what's really important is that you really have a nice combination between those. But that doesn't mean there aren't um, critics or there aren't some things to sort of, I guess, poke holes in in a way. Like you could say, okay, it wasn't randomized trial. It was self-selected. So like you said, it's not apples to oranges. You can't compare necessarily to someone who is randomized to an intervention because these people self-selected. Um, but that's sort of like the way of the world, right? Like you, you people have to buy into it to the beginning anyway. So, I mean, have you heard, you know, criticisms like that? Does that affect you? Does that do you, or do you just kind of brush it off and say no because this is our model, so it doesn't matter? Actually, I, I love criticism, and I, I, I even tell our team, our Verda team, that science is a process. So whenever somebody, let's just use Twitter again, tweets and says, science 
proves that you know yeah. from those three words that that person is wrong. Science <laughs> never proves anything. The best you can do is generate more evidence potentially in support of your hypothesis. And that's everything. That's, you know, the enlightenment, scientific revolution. So I love critics and people poking holes because that's just the nature how things should work. You can't be dogmatic. So that's totally fine. Uh, then on a, on a more practical level, um, you know, we, we now have then some published evidence and peer reviewed that we have, we wrote up the organization We've been able to convince uh, about 300 large U.S. organizations from zero just a couple of years ago, large employers from, you know, Fortune 500 companies that, you know, you'd be able to recognize from, you know, Comcast to Home Depot to UPS to you name it, to large health plans to the U.S. Veterans Organization. So we have, we've had en enough evidence to convince these, what you might call very conservative organizations to say, hey, we want to address type 2 diabetes with this approach, with this company. So that's kind of the step one, yeah. or I should say step two with the initial evidence. And then the step three is, this is happening every day and we're generating, we did a clinical trial, which was a large for our scale, like 400 people, control arm of about 100 but we've treated now several orders of magnitude, like thousands and thousands of patients in a quote-unquote real world, generating evidence every single day, both anecdotal, population level. And I think that is the most powerful data set, and we'll be publishing more and more uh, data from kind of the, the real world. Um, and then again, science is a process, and I, I'm, we will never be able to prove. All we can do is kind of brick by brick build the wall and say, hey, this wall is very solid. Look at these, you know, hundreds of thousands of bricks here. And yeah. if you have questions and criticism, sure, uh, let's talk about it. And that's why, you know, we've always taken the approach that, yeah, we, we collect data, we analyze and we publish and try to be very transparent. Uh, like what's the yeah. impact, impact on our patients? But hopefully criticism never stops because that kind of keeps everyone on their toes and moving the science forward. Yes probably in part due to your physics training as well, like a different view. And I think that's so important because when you're entrenched in the medical world and all you see is what you've been trained, you, you kind of have blinders on. You need someone from an outside perspective, but still with that science background and that science curiosity that physics really can help foster to, to really sort of revolutionize things. And I think that's what you've done. Okay, so you mentioned, you know, you've had over... 300 businesses now and, and, and the U.S. government working with the, the study you had with the VA, and your goal is to reverse diabetes in 100 million people. And there are only you know, 37 million people with diabetes in the U.S. So that would mean everybody in the U.S. plus going internationally. That's a huge scale. And, and like, you're, like you said, you, you can't have you know, hundreds or thousands of doctors, and, um, but you do have the personal touch of coaching and you have the tech component. So how how do you even translate that to 100 million people on that scale um, to reach everybody and make sure they're you know following up and and make it palatable to that many people? I mean, you know, if you can answer that in 30 seconds, you deserve an award because I'm sure that's not a quick. But what are some of the things in your mind that you say, okay, we need to accomplish X, Y, and Z to get to that point to be able to scale this intervention? Perhaps I'm surprising. We, we've taken a very kind of pragmatic approach to how to scale the company and how to scale our impact. And it isn't just one patient, two, ten, hundred thousand, hundred thousand, so forth. It's more, you know, it was step one built the first version of, of the product and the protocol and the platform. That was step one. And obviously the building never ends, but that was the step one. Then step two was what we just talked about, the clinical trials, uh, test the safety and efficacy. So that was kind of the step yeah. two. Then we had the step three, which was like, okay, well, we have a mousetrap that seems to be working. Can we build a business model and get to like 100 customers and, you know, thousands of patients and make the economics work because we can't be a charity and, we can't rely on outside investors forever. So that was the step three. And now we're in the step four, which is like, okay, well, the first product worked okay. And obviously we improved. We have the evidence that it's their safety and efficacy. We got the customers, the business model working. And now the step four is like, 
what are we waiting? Like, how do we scale this to millions? Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're in the middle of that right now. So that's been kind of the approach. And in terms of scaling to millions, the nice thing with what we do is, yes, we have medical doctors, we provide, we have coaches, we have people behind the scenes. But at the end of the day, we only deliver bits and IP packets. We never touch our patients. It's all virtual. And when you only deliver bits, at the end of the day, it's infinitely scalable. And you can always introduce software, data, AI, or artificial intelligence to make the people, people our, our team, much more productive, much more scalable, and higher and higher percentage of our patient needs are serviced by software. Way more now than when we started our clinical trial, for example. So that is really the key to scaling, to helping millions of people and hopefully 100 million at some point. Uh, we aren't going to hire 100 million coaches or even million, um, but but using software. And again, when you think of the, wait a second, you never touch your patients, correct? It's just virtual interaction. That is infinitely scalable. And maybe one day there are patients who don't need any human inter interaction. Yeah, so in, in addition to sort of revolutionizing the treatment of type 2 diabetes and making the concepts of reversal and deprescription prescription so much more common, you're also helping revolutionize uh, telemedicine in a way, which of course took off with COVID, but you've been a leader in that as well. And not to mention the payment structure for your services. Now, you know, putting your fees at risk, you only pay if you, you know, have success. Yeah. Um, it seems like a lot to take on all three of those things, but your company really has. So I want to touch on the, on the payment structure a little bit because I find that so interesting and what you define as success. Cause there could be different definitions is, is deprescription the success you're looking for is normalization of A1C the success you're looking for. How do you define that with the, the businesses you're working with and for the individual? What do you prioritize as a, as a company? First, let me start from the business model and, and then after that, go into the most important, which is our patients. Um, in terms of business model, yeah, to me, it's ridiculous that majority of the U.S. healthcare still functions as fee-for-service, which basically incentivizes economically people to prescribe more tests, diagnostics, operations, transactions. It's ridiculous. And there's historic reasons why we ended up there. But you get what you pay for. And rest assured, we get a lot of wasted money and, and healthcare transactions in the U.S. Yeah. So my take was always, it shouldn't be like that. It should be, how do we make people healthy and healthier, and in our case, reverse type 2 diabetes, and get paid for that? Everybody wins. Like, it's beautiful. <laughs> and even if you just have a bunch of smart MBAs optimizing the business at Verda, they would end up optimizing the volume of patients we treat and succeed with. So that's the fundamental model and uh, with which we go to employers and health plans and say, hey, diabetes, type 2, big problem. What if we fix it? And what if you only pay if we actually deliver results? And then in terms of the specifics, what do we prioritize? I mean... I, I think it's fair to say that 100% of our company DNA is how do we make people healthier and specifically drive them towards type 2 diabetes reversal. And we've tried to align the economic model as close to that as possible. Of course, when we work with health plans, you know, at the end of the day, it's often dollars and cents. So usually right. the outcomes measures are, did we make a person healthier with as objective measures as possible? And with type 2 diabetes, you can measure things like blood sugar, A1C, it's a lab test or daily blood tests. It's very objective. So did that come down and did we get blood sugar to a normal range with the right approach or the optimal approach, which is that you actually get people off of diabetes medications? Because it's one thing to pump more insulin, which isn't solving anything. And another right. thing to get people off of insulin while simultaneously delivering glycemic control. So those are the measures usually. Did we make a patient healthy? And it's around blood sugar and diabetes medications. And then oftentimes we couple that with like total cost savings, either measured as a proxy or actual, you know, dollars, which of course health plans and employers have access to their, their claims data. So, so that's the approach we've used. And I wish, I hope, my hope is more and more of the U.S. healthcare 
will move towards these type of very pragmatic value-based payment models. Yeah, I mean, that, it, you could yeah. almost say it makes so much sense, it makes too much sense, too much sense for our medical uh, institutions to adopt in a way. Um, but it also, it's interesting because you, like you're saying, you could optimize the blood sugar control even more um, and lower A1C even more if you kept medications on, if you kept the patients on their medications. But the cost savings, the immediate cost savings come from reducing those medications, which could actually hurt the data a little bit if you're looking, if you're focusing just on A1C, but it makes the patient healthier and it reduces costs by getting people off the medication. So that's one thing I find so interesting because when you look at the A1C trends, sometimes critics, again, a critic could say, eh, you know, so it went from, sorry, let me get the right data here. It went from uh, 7.5 to 6.6 .6 at your two-year data. And someone could say, all right, I mean, it could have been better, but that was also with like the 95% reduction in insulin and, and all the medications. So you have to dig a little bit deeper um, and to realize at the same time the control A1C went up. So it really is that sort of combination. And, and again, I'm wondering if you've gotten the pushback that saying your data is not that impressive from an A1C standpoint. And you have to say, but wait, but wait, this was with reduction in medication. Does that, does that interaction happen a lot with some of your prospective clients? Uh, sometimes. Uh, let, let me clarify there a couple of things. F first, I have to say that we don't manipulate like uh, how much should we reduce diabetes medications to save a certain amount of money. It's very, very clear that it is where the providers, it's in their sole discretion and decision how to manage medications for patients. And, you know, we, we are, we have a professional corporation where we have medical doctors delivering clinical care. And it is their decision whose medications are reduced and who's not. And as, as you know, as a medical doctor, hypoglycemic drugs, it's not really a choice. If your blood sugar comes down naturally, yeah. there, there's no wiggle room. You have <laughs> to pull people off of insulin. Otherwise, you have hypoglycemia, which is very, very dangerous. So the protocols to reduce medications, they are 100% exclusively in the hands of our doctors and based purely on what is safe. For the patient and then how the numbers fall sort of the analytics and how much money we save is just it is what it is so 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 that that's a very important clarification but to your question about a1c oh my god don't even get me started like there are so many companies and studies where like if you just want to cook the a1c numbers legitimately to show massive drop it's so easy to fake it like it's ridiculous so we sometimes go into these conversations and so i just want to be very clear that if you look at even our clinical trial data and you only look at patients who came in with like A1C above 9 or 10, you know, they dropped their A1C on average like 3 or 4 percentage points from like That's 11 amazing. to 7 or 9 to 6 or something like that. And so it, it's so easy to play around with these A1C numbers. Like if you want to design a small study and show a massive absolute drop, like three points, it's very easy. You just self-select the right type of group and then have a massive drop. So, so go to our results specifically. The, to deliver that kind of a drop on a population level from like, I think start to one year, we had something like from 7.6 to 6.4 or something like that. That's a phenomenal improvement. And yes, we did it while eliminating diabetes medications, not adding them. So it's a very, very important, obviously, clarification because you could run that study as an insulin manufacturer and say, hey, we got A1C yeah. down from 7.6 to, I don't know, 6.6. .6. So it is always important to look at those two at the same time, glycemic control, one, and two, what happened to hypoglycemic drugs. Um, and the, the kind of the grand slam, the, I, I guess the Nobel Prize winning accomplishment would be you take a population, you bring blood sugars down, while doing the unthinkable, that you can actually reduce hypoglycemic drugs. And, and that's basically what we deliver. But again, oh my God, there's so many ways to like play around with the A1C and put headlines how we drop two points. And you, you kind of have to look at the big picture, but I would say nine out of 10, 10 chief medical officers of large health plans and employers, they know these games and they're very yeah. sophisticated. They look at the big picture and they get the story. 
Uh, but people who just, you know, read Twitter, there's oftentimes those headlines like, hey, we did a study, three point drop in A1C, amazing, amazing. And then you dig into it and it's like, all right, that's complete hot air. Yeah, I think that's such a great perspective to hear about how, um, depending on how you design the study, you can cook the numbers, so to speak. And also, like, are you lowering it over, you know, three or four months and then it comes right back up at, at six or eight months? So that's why it's so important that you have your, your long term data as well. But we've talked about medications, we've talked about, you know, A1C, but there are also so many other aspects, you know, whether you look at your HOMA IR, your triglycerides, your HDL, all these other metabolic, uh, metabolic factors. And one thing that I point to frequently in, in one of the trials that, that Dr. Sarah Hallberg and others ran was how the LDL went up 10% at one year, but the calculated cardiovascular risk went down 12%. And, and that's, also sort of revolutionizing for so many in the medical field to think that risk can go down while LDL goes up. But my point for bringing it up is I'm sure one of the pushbacks you get by using a low-carb ketogenic intervention is the old guard who still believes it's not safe long-term, their concerns long-term, and that even five-year data isn't long enough. Um, I'm curious how you see that in terms of the, the pushback from the medical community and what you can do to help rectify that as a company um, for the longer term and for the greater good of the of the patients who are benefiting. Yeah. Well, first, let me start with the caveat. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor or medical scientist, and I don't play one on the internet. So <laughs> th th let's just put it there. So I'm, I'm a little bit of an yeah. amateur here. But yeah, I, I think we've taken a very simple approach. Uh, let's generate as much data as possible and publish it and then show it to people and say, hey, take a look at this. What do you think? Here's, here's the evidence for safety and uh, efficacy and, and also effectiveness. And, um, you know, uh, when it comes to nutrition, low carbohydrate eating pattern is now perhaps largely thanks to what we've done and published is now in the American Diabetes Association medical standards of care as a recommended eating pattern for people with type 2 diabetes. And, you know, that's that you don't get to those guidelines by waving hands or you know, throwing out some tweets, you get right. there with evidence. And so the, the evidence is pretty compelling that this kind of an eating pattern, yes, glycemic control, blood sugar comes down, but blood pressure comes down. Uh, your cardiovascular risk, cardiovascular disease risk seems to come down. Inflammation comes down. Insulin resistance comes, comes down. The, uh, the pattern of your LDL particles or particle size goes towards the healthier kind. So you have less of these super small, dense ones and more the fluffy ones. So our approach has really been generate data from a well-controlled trial, analyze it well and publish it and show to the whole world, here it is, yeah. make your conclusions. And, and so, so that's been our approach and it worked very well. And again, since I'm not a scientist, I, I can throw some anecdotes. For us, it's at the end of the day, it's like, you know, patients choose at the end of the day as well. We may work with a large organization who makes a decision for their population. But at the end of the day, patients individually choose to be better patients. And like, you can talk to all of them. You know, we have patients, this sort of blows my mind away. So you probably see that Verta company logo, this spark here. We now have a number of patients who, you know, reverse their diabetes off of insulin. Like they talk about, they use terms like, I got my life back. I feel like I have a decade or decades more life. And several of them have permanently tattooed this logo that I have on my t-shirt. And to me, it's mind blowing. Does that happen in healthcare? Does anyone have their <laughs> pharma company's logo tattooed on their body? Does anyone have their insurance company logo tattooed on their body? And that to me is the ultimate testimonial. People have the choice in America to say, okay, what's the care I want? What do I want to do? And it's so blatantly obvious to our patients. It's ridiculous to live with type 2 diabetes. Stick the insulin needle into your body. Be tired. All the numbers are always getting worse year by year versus what they're experiencing now. Here with papers or not, they're like, this is so blatantly obvious. Yeah. I want to stay on this plan because I'm actually feeling like a human again. Yeah, those those anecdotes are so powerful and really can just like motivate an entire company to make you realize what you're doing and the impact you're having on people's lives. 
I could just see though, now like the drug companies are going to be paying people to tattoo their names on them. They'll say, see, we have it too, but they've got to, <laughs> they're going to have to incentivize people a little bit more than what you've had to do. Yeah. So I'm curious though, to, to sort of start to wrap up here, the, like, you know, any company that has a product, they know not a hundred percent of people are going to use the product, stick with the product and have success with the product. So part of the company research is saying, okay, what isn't working for those people and what can we do to adapt it to reach more people? So I'm curious what, what Verda has learned from that subset of, of people that, you know, still it's not a hundred percent, um, adherence it's not a hundred percent success. So in your, your own internal research, what have you found to say, these are some of the hurdles we still have to overcome to help more people? Well, I would say Probably majority of our product development team's effort and focus every single day is that. Like, how can we succeed with 100% of the people, 100% of the time? And obviously, that's a goal that we'll never reach. So we, we, we are constantly working on that. So I would say a couple of things. First, I'll start from the positive. You know, we've treated now patients in every, all 50 states in America, basically all ethnicities, men, women, different age. Uh, we looked at data, for example, across what's called ADI area deprivation index. So people who are living in a poorer conditions, not access. We haven't published this yet, but I, I can say sort of the headline is outcomes are the same. And this is kind of health equity, which in America yeah. in general, and particularly for chronic disease, you get the worst outcomes and worse access, the more sort of a deprived area you're living. We've actually been able to deliver the same results. And with this virtual care delivery model, um, you know, anyone can, if you have a smartphone, you have access to it. And, you know, if your helpline covers, it's, it's, it's free. So that's kind of on a positive note that we've actually seen phenomenally good results across pretty much any population we treat. But then the things that we are constantly working on, um, a couple of examples. So one is just an individualization to the level of N equals one. And when it comes to nutrition, this is so important. Imagine if you are vegan by... That's your thing. We can't tell you to eat bacon for breakfast. We would lose you immediately. So, mm -hmm. and it may be tied to your ethnicity, your history, your culture, your religion. Uh, so individualization is one thing. And we've learned it sometimes the hard way. Like, yeah, you, you just one size fits all or even hundred different approaches is not enough. We have to be able to individual to the N equals one. And we're working on that constantly. Obviously, software and technology allows us to do that at scale, so we don't have to have like people always customizing. So, so that's kind of one thing that we're working on. And then the second example I give is one of the biggest challenges we deal with to succeed is when life happens, and yes. life happens all the time. Death in a family, COVID, you lose your job, you move to a new place, something going on with your kids, you name it. These are sort of like, left field shocks to the system and you might be like succeeding perfectly you've got the right nutrition and you and then suddenly you're like i'm so overwhelmed in my life that i can't think of anything other than i don't know taking care of my daughter who's in a hospital and so mm -hmm. addressing those situations providing the support it's very complicated because you can't just say oh it's mental health it's also the kind of resilience and toolkits we give to patients. But that's one area that we're constantly working to minimize the number of times that life happens and people go off the rails. And that's very, very complicated. But we made pretty phenomenal progress in, in that area. Yeah, it's such a good point. I mean, and, and when life does happen, to be able to get right back to where you were without too much of a disruption, to have it a nearly seamless transition, because you're right, it does. And such good points and, and su such a wonderful discussion overall and, and yeah. to sort of lay out the whole framework of what Verta Health has done and where it started and where it's going and all the different parts. Um, so th I just want to thank you for taking the time to join me and for all the work you're doing at Verta Health and especially the contribution to science and the contribution to um, really revolutionizing so many aspects of medical care. And I'm eager to just keep following along and see what you do next. So um, any any last thoughts or let us know what is coming next for Verta Health? Well, I, I think the last thought, I, I, I just want to give credit where credit is due because, uh, you know, I, I personally, as a CEO and co-founder, stand on the shoulders of, of the real giants. I just want to give credit to the late Dr. Sarah Halberg, who was absolutely instrumental in helping us get where we are. And of course, my scientific co-founders, 
Dr. Finney and Dr. Jeff Bolek. And in, in truly, I am standing on the shoulders of, of scientific uh, giants. And that is why we are here. And that's why we have the evidence. And that's why we have the commercial success that we've, we've had so far. So I might be speaking here, but I'm kind of speaking on behalf of, of many, many others. Yeah, no question. You have assembled a phenomenal top top ranked uh, team there. And that's a big role of a CEO to make sure you surround yourself with the best. And you certainly did that. So congratulations for all your success. And uh, thanks for all you've done. And thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much.